Welcome back. I want to take a quick second to tell you about our sponsor of today's episode of North American Deer Talk, CNE Wildlife Products. CNE Wildlife is a trusted leader in biotechnology for the cervid industry. They offer microencapsulated bacteria products that are research supported through Texas Tech University. With more than 30 years of experience and commitment to all natural probiotics, this product line continues to be a mainstay in herd management programs across North America. And the reason is simple. They are passionate about the cervid industry. They have products for elk, whitetail, muleys, red deer, and more. With products ranging from Fawn Paste and Electromax to Guardian Plus, Whitetail Energy Pack, Jumpstart, or their ever popular Top Score Extreme, they just flat out work. We've been a CNE Wildlife product user for more than 15 years. To learn more about CNE Wildlife, check out episode 54 of North American Deer Talk, a probiotics masterclass with CNE owner Sadie Horrocks, and give her a call today to start using the products we do here. Good afternoon. At least it's afternoon here. Welcome back to another episode of North American Deer Talk. This is your host, Josh Newton, episode 66 today. I have a note here. It's probably a little hyperbolic, but I'll say it anyway. The title of the show is The Slow Creep of Tyranny. We're going to talk about what that means in the deer world. You know what we're going to talk about? Some CWD stuff, but we're going to talk about business practices and all the different things that you can do on a deer farm and why it's important to have those opportunities to do those things. So keep that in mind as we work through this together. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, thank you. Make sure you hit that subscribe and follow button. If you think the episodes are worthy, share them out. Love to get a little more traction on social media. We're going to keep doing these shows here. Um, as you saw just prior to me coming on, we have a new uh, CNE commercial, and that's for the new 2022 2023 year. They've decided to come back on board as a sponsor. We're just really glad to partner up with them. We use these products all the time on our farm. So. We think that they uh, are worth spending money on and they work well. Hopefully you have the same reactions. Check them out. Um, you can also follow us over on Instagram, servid underscore solutions. Don't forget about the deer wizard and the upcoming cwdbreeding.com is going to be launched here, hopefully in the next call it two weeks. So uh, look for more on that soon. Anyway, right into the topic of the show today. So if you're on the video, and I will try to do my best for those listening on the audio, uh, we're going to work through a couple things. And in the, if you haven't listened to the previous episode, episode uh, 65, check that out. I talked about, you know, some of the stuff PDFA does and kind of the importance of the state uh, associations and a little bit on the national side. Um, but one of the things that we've been contesting with here for some time is, you know, we, our regulatory status is under the department of ag. We, as, uh, you know, deer farmers and, and ranchers in the state of Pennsylvania ask for that, uh, regulatory oversight because we're a livestock industry. And while the animals exist on the outside of the fence in a quote unquote wildlife setting, um, we manage our animals, um, you know, at least from a, a general practice uh, as ranch stock, right? So uh, we needed a, a uh, regulatory body that uh, had the uh, technical exper expertise from an animal health standpoint. And um, that was the Department of Ag. So anyway, we we have this uh, kind of ideological divide between our wildlife, which is the uh, Pennsylvania Game Commission, and ourselves. And of course, it's over chronic waste and disease. Uh, I have my my general thoughts and opinions on 
uh, why that is. And I think it's mostly ideological uh, separation on the hunting side of things and, you know, what people perceive as hunting and what they don't. Uh, and everybody's entitled to their opinion. Uh, and we'll just leave that at that. But from a CWD standpoint, um, we are all hunters, at least every deer farmer and rancher I know is a hunter. Uh, I don't know any that aren't. And that's pretty much why we all got into this. Cause we, we, you know, we love the white tailed deer and we wanted, we wanted some more of it. And, um, you know, the, the hunting season that is handed to us was, was not good enough. So anyway, uh, we deal with a whole host of, of issues, uh, mostly stemming from the Pennsylvania game commission. And, and I guess more recently from the national deer association or, or NDA, they seem to be the, um, uh, the media arm for, for PGC as of late. And, um, if you've seen, you know, any of their, their articles, it's always, you know, deer, deer farms are the problem, shut them down. And, you know, anybody that is rational or sane can look at that and say, okay, so we, we shut down the deer farms, but CWD still exists. So what are you going to do? And there's no answer to that. Uh, we're fortunate that we, we have some, um, science and technology that is, um, becoming more and more and more integrated into our industry. And I, I think in a, a fairly short period of time, at least in the, uh, the history of, of what CWD looks like, you're going to find a, a, a vibrant servant industry, um, you know, have less and less and less and less, uh, chronic wasting disease. And I, I'm not sure what, what, uh, other people are going to point to after we, you know, we kind of beat that, that thing back. So anyway, we deal with this on a consistent basis. So I want to take a look at the Pennsylvania Deer Farmers Association Facebook page. So again, if you're, if you're following along on, on the audio, I will try to be as descriptive as possible, but I think this kind of, when we look at this, this'll, this'll be, um, this will be telling and, you know, it's a, I call it a, a win for the industry and uh, I'll get to that in one second. So I'm just going to go ahead and do a little screen share here. So bear with me and let's check this out. There we are. Okay. So September 1st, I would say, uh, you know, this seems like an ongoing battle, but call it um, a month ago. Uh, I had started just running through some posts and, and these were uh, some of this, most, most of this was provided to me by one of our, our board members who has a, a very large scent company, uh, nationwide sense. Many of you know him, uh, super guy, and that is Elam Lap Jr. So um, I started by, by posting about um, talking about urine and urine based hunting sense and the impending decision to ban urine, uh, urine-based hunting scents in the coming weeks by the Pennsylvania Game Commission. So we were waiting for a date on their quarterly meeting that happened to be the 22nd, 23rd, 23rd, 24th. So just, it was this past Saturday anyway. Um, and I, I just ran through uh, a few things that I thought were really interesting. So um, if, you, if you don't know about uh, urine, we're going to kind of Stick on, stick on that topic today. And, you know, for those of you who are like, I don't care about urine, you should. And it's not so much that you care about urine, it's that you care about a segment of the servant industry that provides income as part of a, a full stack of uh, products that uh, deer farms and ranches sell. So you can think of um, urine or the urine industry as the breeding stock industry or the hunting industry or any of those other things. And it's important to note that this is how the slow creep of tyranny spreads, right? And you're like, Josh, what are you, what are you talking about? What, why are we talking about creeping tyranny today? It's real simple. When you look at all the different things that we do as part of our businesses, as part of our lives, the easiest way to chip away at those things as is little bits at a time. And I've heard some others talk about this. One of them being Jordan Peterson. And it was really just really interesting at, at what he said and kind of his analysis on that. And it was basically something like, 
you know, if, if you want to control people, um, you put in place regulations, uh, restrictions, rules, laws, and you push them as far down the road as you can. People get up in arms. You take two steps back and you sit and you wait. People become accustomed to those new things or parts of those new things. Everybody settles down. Emotions are are tamped down. And then on we go to the next and push, 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 push. People get up in arms, walk it back a little bit. And you can see how that slow creep gets you down the road further and further and further. So again, using urine is one aspect of the larger picture to the chronic waste and disease puzzle. So let's talk about some of the specifics of it. And you can learn a little bit more if you're not familiar with it. Like, like I wasn't, I know that people collected urine. Um, but I, I, I want to know more about it and, and some of the, um, you know, kind of latest research. So while the research, and I'm, I'm reading here from a, from a, uh, a post that we made. While the research does suggest doses as small as 300 nanograms of brain material from an infected deer could be enough to infect an animal, prion levels in brain material from an infected animal are more than 1 million times more than urine from the same animal. Again, brain material is a million times more infective. A million that's a big number than urine from the same animal. So to put that in perspective, it would take 30,000 gallons of urine from an infected animal to contain the same amount of infectious prions as one gram of brain material. So just imagine a piece of brain material the size of a paper clip is equal to 30,000 gallons of infected urine. 30,000 gallons. Want to know what that is? That's a swimming pool. Yep. When was the last time you saw a swimming pool full of urine, pure urine from an infective animal just rolling around on the landscape? Never. It would take at least 10 ounces of urine entirely from an infected deer to produce a potentially infectious dose equivalent to 300 nanograms of brain material. That entire amount would need to be consumed by a single animal to have the risk of infection. In no situation is this practical of hunting sense creating this risk. So from a practicality standpoint, boy, it's really, really hard for urine to become that infective agent. So there was a gentleman... Um, Dr. Davin Henderson, many of you have heard of him, super nice guy, works at CWD Evolution, and that is a um, facility that does testing using RT Quick technology. So again, if you're on the video, I'm going to scroll up, I'm trying not to jump around too, too much. So I made another follow-up post, right? This was the next day because I wanted to have people engage on this, and you know, frankly, if you're if you're not following the Pennsylvania Deer Farmers Association Facebook page, head over there and check it out because we do try to post regularly about all the things that are going on. There's some good stuff on there. There's some really, really nice info. Um, there's some fun stuff. There's pictures. Um, but generally speaking, it's a it's a good page to follow. So I followed up on that post and I said, you know, knowing what we know about this. Uh, infectivity level in urine, there are some things that um, some folks do that add a little bit of assurance to regulators, and it's something they do on their own. So here's a little excerpt from that. Responsible Hunting Scent Association credibility and oversight. It's true that no federal agency, such as the FDA, or you're gonna to have to excuse me here. I'm gonna I'm gonna plug in. Bear with me. Bear with me. Should have done this before. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, my uh, recording device just started chirping at me. Sorry about that. 
Um, it's true that no federal agency such as the FDA. Yeah, folks, this is this is real time. We do this in real time. Um, no federal agency such as FDA or USDA has explicit oversight over deer urine or scent products. Now, let's just pause there for one second. Do we really need another um, government agency regulating these specific things? I would say probably not. Generally speaking, I think industry is very interesting, very interested in conservation and um, you know, preserving our livelihood, making sure that all of the products we have are safe. And of course, in this case, not spreading disease. So keep that in mind. Uh, that's why responsible scent manufacturers worked with their primary trade group, the Archery Trade Association, to develop a set of standards for management of the urine sources. Participation in the DPP program is voluntary, but compliance is mandatory to utilize the registered trades marks of the RHSA Deer Protection Program, and that's that DPP check mark. Use of the logo. Uh, without authorization, violates trademarks uh, and truth in advertising statutes. So uh, likewise, there's an RT Quick logo from CW Evolution, um, and that's restric restricted to only compliant materials. Um, and so what I think this shows is that industry has tools and um, they are, you know, moving forward in a self-regulatory way. So just a touch more on the um, part of this program that I think is interesting. So in this case, we have, again, uh, a scent manufacturer here in the, in the state that has chosen to be a part of this and worked um, to help safeguard the urine they produce. And they send off all their batches. I mean, not some, all of the urine that goes out the door is tested using RT Quick. Now, if you know anything about RT Quick, it's an amplification uh, system, and it typically finds stuff in early stages. Um, so obviously, with CWD being a reportable disease, they can't just find it and bury it under the rug. That's not how it works. So this stuff's all clean. And if it is found, then it's dealt with through the proper regulatory channels. So I thought that was interesting. Okay. So we're building here, folks. We're building, right? And and we're gonna hop back into the into the uh the tyranny zone with a little crescendo soon. So it's the last note I did, right? So this was about a week later. This is on congregation. Now, remember 10 ounces from an infected animal, has to be a late stage animal, has to be consumed directly into one deer to produce approximately 300 nanograms, which may be an infectious dose, right? Okay. Quote, arguments have been made to the Pennsylvania Game Commission that urine-based scents could congregate wildlife and create risk of spreading the disease. Hunting scents influence only the cervid that pass within the scenting range. And while the scents temporarily peak curiosity, and may cause a deer to pause within a shooting lane. Deer do not congregate at scent sets as they do with food sources. When you consider the cost of hunting scents and that most hunting scents come in little bottles utilized for a small number of days of year, while each of the wild deer can release 42 to 64 ounces of urine every day and up to 150 gallons a year, that's a lot, a lot of a lot of pee a year. The idea that hunter place scents are causing any significant congregation beyond what is already naturally occurring is implausible. If anything, hunters scent use adds to naturally occurring scent deposits by local wild deer and can reduce congregation. Some great points there. Some great points. So we posted those things up and um, again, if you want to find out and be part of PDFA or at least follow Facebook page, you should do that. And and we try to we try to maintain this um, activity level throughout the year. I do the best I can. It's primarily a page that 
um, I operate. And of course, when people send me stuff like that, that I find compelling, I will share and comment. So here we are, we get to talk about that. So what does this all mean? Well, the proposed ban was put forward. So it was brought up at the last Pennsylvania Game Commission meeting. And this affects if if you're a if you're a CLO in the state of uh, Pennsylvania, a service livestock operator, you have the potential to collect urine, right? And you can go as big or as little as you want, but it's a opportunity to create additional revenue for your farm, and that's I think that's important uh, when you look at the commerce restrictions that are applied to. Uh, various operations for whatever reason regarding CWD, every time there's regulatory action, uh, it chips away at our ability to to do business, right? And in this case, it was the Pennsylvania Game Commission, um, you know, flexing its muscles on on this. And um, it's concerning that they they didn't want to look at this from a, a scientific standpoint and and have more of a you know, a, a quite rational uh, look at this, but there is public comment before the meetings. And I thought the one thing that was very interesting is we had quite a few people there from uh, the Pennsylvania Deer Farmers Association, as well as hunters uh, and, and Dr. Henderson showed up, which was, uh, which was great. The comments um, take place prior to the meeting. So there's no response or rebuttal to anything, uh, but the commissioners do hear those. So we have uh, nine commissioners in the state. One was absent and it's um, the, the, the ban did not get put into place. So um, kudos to the folks that made it over there. I was at a veterinarian conference uh, this weekend uh, last week weekend uh, for New Dart. And you guys all know that I work for them, so I get to do those um, those conferences. And um, I was not able to attend, unfortunately. And I, I like to go to these things and you know talk about what we do and the importance of it. So uh, thanks to those who showed up. I know that our lobbyist uh, Carrie Lang was there, our VP Emily Hughes, as well as uh, Junior Lap, and I believe. Uh, Ike Martin. So thanks. Thanks to you guys for going. Um, this is, I think, just another case where uh, people ask what uh, PDFA is doing. That's exactly what we're doing. We're doing our best to try to, you know, um, stop any, you know, pieces of, of harmful uh, regulatory, um, you know, paperwork that comes our way or, um, you know, things that that just are not good for our business. And, and I think this is a great example of that. So thank you to all those that participated. It's, um, it's good to see that that happened. And I, I just, um, I want, I, let me, I should have queued this up beforehand, but I just wanted to highlight, um, highlight this. So the proposed statewide ban of the use and field possession of urine-based deer attractants and other cervid excretions failed to gain majority support by the Board of Commissioners for the, the Pennsylvania Game Commission, meaning it will advance no further towards adoption at this time. The Board of Commissioners was split 4-4 on whether it should move towards final adoption. So um, quick shout out to uh, and I, I apologize if I butcher your name, not that, not that you're listening, but um, to the commissioners, uh, Kristen Schnepp Geiger, Alan DeMarco, Stanley Nick Jr., and Haley Sankey. Um, thank you. They voted against this uh, prelim approval. Thank you to those, those four. That seems like a very common sense approach, uh, given the you know, the science just doesn't add up. Now, of course, there's comments by those who uh, voted in support of it saying, we're just going to bring this back up later. So is the fight ever really over? No, it's not, ladies and gentlemen. And again, uh, it's important. This, again, this is why we have 
a lobbyist in place so they can keep track of all this stuff because I don't live in Harrisburg. Uh, I, I'm a volunteer. And uh, I just I, I can't keep up on it. So they tell us about it. And then we try to, you know, we try to work on those issues and, and rally support. And, you know, if you've dealt with government for any uh, significant period of time, you know that it's incredibly hard. And I don't want to say it's a losing battle, um, but it's it's really, really hard. So um, this is the importance. Again, I feel like I'm, I'm doing a back to back show on on PDFA, but like this stuff comes up and uh, again, replace replace urine with uh hunting or you know like uh, some some zealots call it like canned hunting or who who knows i don't even know what that is um they just don't like what we do and you know there's another chip away and you know they want to restrict us from uh selling meat or they want to restrict us from uh being able to sell antlers or urine or hides or you can come up with any little thing and and that is the slow creep of tyranny. So hopefully you all enjoyed this show. Um, I, I'm, I, I, I felt that it was uh, worthwhile to talk about a little bit and, you know, hopefully I, I actually, I, I mean, I, I, I'm glad that the outcome at least temporarily was in a positive manner. It's almost always not. It's almost always that like those motions pass and then we get a statewide you know, um, urine ban and, you know, it just takes away from opportunity of hunters in the field to use products and, and have opportunity to, to harvest deer, um, in a, in a manner that they see fit and that is ethical. And it also chips away at our ability to run our businesses in a, again, safe and, and ethical manner. So we'll leave that there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I really appreciate all listening and taking the time, uh, to to watch these shows and and listen to me uh, over here ramble on. If you have any comments, questions, um, know someone that you think would be interesting on the show uh, to do an interview to talk some deer. I always I like doing this stuff. Um, I I hope that you know it comes across as a you know somewhat of a, a service. It it takes a little bit of time. I don't mind applying that time uh, when I have it, and I try to make time. Uh, as part of what I do for, um, for, you know, my little, my little chip in, in the, in the bigger picture of the deer industry. So with that, stay tuned for another episode of North American Deer Talk. <laughs>